Well, we are in Genesis chapter 20 tonight in your Bibles. If you want to turn there, Genesis chapter 20. The title of the message is Old Sin. We've been working through a series I've titled Genesis in the Beginning God. Because Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This book of Genesis is all about God. This book of the Bible is all about God. Sure, there's stories of man in here and women in here. But ultimately, it's just about them messing up all the time. And God showing up and saving the day over and over. Because that's what humans do. We drop the ball, we sin, and God comes and saves the day. It's the message of redemption in the gospel over and over and over throughout the Bible. And so as you read and study through the scripture, you need to be looking through, seeking for attributes of God's love, attributes of this message, characteristics of the gospel, and we will see it once again tonight. Last time we were together in the book of Genesis, we saw God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember? The wicked city, the rebellious people who hated God. But not only did they hate God, but they were displaying such wicked things upon each other. They were raping, killing, stealing from, abusing each other. Chaos in this city, completely depraved and far beyond turning to God. God said, I cannot allow this to go on any longer. I will destroy this city because they are just destroying everyone, destroying people. And remember, he saved Lot and his two daughters. Made it out, but Lot's wife was left. Well, Lot, instead of going back to his uncle Abraham and staying there with him where it's safe, you know what he does? He goes and stays in a cave. Remember? He stays in a cave there with his two daughters, secluded away from society, away from those who are righteous and holy. And he ends up, some really wicked things happen there in that cave. The text told us that the daughters got their dad drunk. And the daughters slept with their father and became pregnant. And that is how the story ends of Lot and his family. Is that sad or what? Because of the bad example of Lot and because of the tendencies of the culture in Sodom and Gomorrah, it infected his family so deeply that they were prone to do such wicked things. They thought it was okay. They thought it was, would work out just fine. But Lot goes, goes down as a man who sets a terrible example for his family. But tonight, we will see the grace of God on display again. The story of Abraham, Lot's uncle, picks up. Yes, Father Abraham. Remember, Abram, now called Abraham, has been promised a son. Do you know how old Abraham is in our story now? He's 99, 100 years old. His wife is 90 years old. They are old, yes, up in age, up in years. But God has still promised them a child. And he has made a covenant with Abraham that through him will come forth the nation of believers. That through him will come forth the Jewish nation. That through him will come forth descendants as many as the stars in the sky. The only problem is, he doesn't have that son yet. And he's like a hundred years old. And he's wondering whether or not God is going to give him that son. And so, it's really sad in our story tonight. I wish it would be a story that we could see Abraham, the man of faith, do something great. But he falls right into the category of sinner once again, just like you and me. And he puts God's grace on display because of his great faults. Tonight we will see Abraham get himself into trouble, needing God's grace. The sad thing is, Abraham will fall in to the exact same sin that he fell into before. The exact same sin. Say exact. Exact same sin. That's why I titled the message, Old Sin. Genesis chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Are you there? It says this, And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, what does he say? She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Does this story sound familiar? You Bible students know. Remember what happened last time back in Genesis 12? There was a famine in the land, no food. And so instead of Abraham, the man of faith, what should we do when we don't have food? 
cry out to God and ask Him to provide and take care of us. Nope. Instead of doing that, you know what he does? He goes to Egypt. <laughs> he goes to Egypt. He goes to Pharaoh. And he's scared that Pharaoh is going to kill him and take his wife. And so he says, Sarah, my wife, tell Pharaoh that we're brother and sister and everything's going to be cool. It created a huge disaster. All these problems came forth from him not trusting in God, trying to take matters into his own hands. And watch this. Here he is falling back into the same sin as he did last time. The same exact sin. Didn't he learn his lesson? It's interesting how we can fall back into the same thing so easily. You think we would learn, but it happens to all of us, doesn't it? Each one of you, and myself included, we all have individual struggles. Some of you struggle with one thing more than another, and we can't sit here and say, look at that person over there. Why do they struggle with that so much? I don't understand. Because they can point back at you and say the exact same thing. We all have individual struggles. We all have things that get at us. Isn't it amazing? We've been walking with the Lord for this long. We've been seeking the Lord for this long. We've made mistakes in the past, and we seem to fall into the exact same sin sometimes. Our hearts are prone in a certain direction of sin. We are tempted in a certain direction constantly. Why does this happen? Jeremiah 17, 9, you know it. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things beyond cure. Who can understand it? Your heart is prone to sin. And... I'm not sure why, but maybe because of the circumstances in your life or the experiences that you've gone through or some of the initial temptations and sins that you fell into in life, your heart has been shaped and moved to want to be inclined towards specific sins over and over again. We see Abraham do that. When we become Christians, when we believe the gospel message, when we turn our hearts and our lives over to God, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us to help us overcome sin in our lives and to seek God all the days of our lives. He is what guides us. The issue is the old sinful body is still here. Check this out. Take a look at my bald head. That's straight up sin right there, okay, my friend. I would have an afro out to here, right, if, I, if sin didn't set in. There is sin in my body and it hasn't gone away yet. That's a joke. Come on, lighten up. No, but do you know that? Don't you notice that? I came to know Jesus and I'm never going to be tempted again, right? No more sin. Everything's going to be perfect, right? No. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us now, and so now we can overcome sin. We actually have the power of God living inside of us to say no to sin before you didn't have that, and so sin would just overtake you constantly. But now you have Almighty God living inside of you. Romans 8 says the same, the same. Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead actually lives inside of us. That's a, that's a lot of power. The Spirit inside of us is warring against the flesh. And the flesh constantly wants to do wrong. And the Spirit wants us to do right. You feel like schizophrenic sometimes, huh? You come in here and you're like, I love you, God. I love you, God. And you walk into this place like sin, 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 sin. You're like, what is wrong with me? Romans 7 describes it clearly. Verse 21, Paul says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. He says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Watch this. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Verse 25, he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is, he says, in my mind I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature I am a slave to sin. It seems like that sometimes, doesn't it? But no longer a slave to sin ultimately, but a slave to Almighty God and His Spirit. So this is what's happening to us. There's a war of the flesh and the Spirit. The only one to deliver us 
from this war is the Lord Jesus. Did you know that? You can't deliver yourself. Did you know that? Do you know that you're going to be tempted probably tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next week and the next month and the next year and, and two years after that and ten years after that? you know you're going to be tempted continually? What? That sounds like a battle. That sounds like a war that's never ending. Yes, it will not stop until we enter into heaven. But watch this. Who can deliver us from this sin? Jesus. He is the only one who can free us. He is the only one who can keep us. The only one to deliver us from this sin day to day is the Lord Jesus. We must stay dependent on him daily. Say daily with me. Daily. Say daily with me. Daily. daily. You must stay dependent on him daily. The sin that remains in our flesh daily is a reminder we need Jesus daily. You see that? The fact that sin stirs up inside of me just reminds me that I need Jesus all the more again and again. So every time sin flushes into your heart, you know what you do? Be reminded of Jesus and look to him. Lord, just say this, Lord, save me a sinner. Just cry out to him as you're being tempted as you feel like you want to dive into sin again, just cry out to God, Lord, save me a sinner. I need you. I worship you now. Sing a song. Open the word. Pray and talk to the Lord about your sin and what's going on in your heart. Worship God. Hebrews 12, 1 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily, easily, easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. This is a race, and this is a long-distance race. This isn't a sprint, my friends. There's going to be potholes in the road. We're just going for a jog, and, and we need to stay persistent and dedicated to the Lord all the days of our life. How do I do that? You can't without Christ. And I'm telling you tonight, the day that you choose not to be dependent on Jesus is the day that you will fall. Your heart will overtake you. The deceitfulness of sin will overtake you. And so what do I need to do daily? Depend on Jesus. Say depend on Jesus. Tell your neighbor you need to depend on Jesus. It's true we need to depend on him daily. So what should you do? In the morning, why don't you wake up depending on Jesus? What's the first thing you should do? Get on your knees and bow before the Lord and just say, I'm a sinner and I need you, Jesus, today. I need you. I worship you now. I commit myself to you now. Lord, would you fill me with your spirit new and afresh? Use me today to glorify yourself. Keep me from temptation. Deliver me from evil. Abraham lets his sin that easily entraps him overtake him once again. He didn't turn, he didn't turn to the Lord in this moment. The great Abraham returns to his old sin. Yes, we encourage people of God, even the greatest men and women of the faith, fail and sin. What? Yeah. That's right. Those that you put on a pedestal are sinners as well, and they need Christ every single day. We all need Jesus. No one gets away from it. Maybe you're struggling with an old sin tonight. You say, man, what's wrong with me? Why am I being tempted? Why can't I get away from this? I thought I was delivered from this. Listen, all it is is a great moment for you to be able to turn to Christ and declare that you need Him. That's what it's there for. Can you be tempted and not sin? Oh, yeah. Temptation comes and stares you in the face. Here is the opportunity to repent to Christ in that moment. I need you. Every time, turn to the Lord. Tonight is a great moment for you to do that as well. Everyone needs to repent. Did you know that? But I'm a Christian. I don't need to repent. That's new believer stuff. Eh. We need to repent to the Lord every day. My heart is turning away from God constantly. And I need to turn it back to the Lord all the time. I believe if Abraham would have turned his heart to the Lord here he would have saw clearly 
that God was going to deliver him and take care of him. He did not need to take matters into his own hands. Abraham is making a bad decision, not trusting the Lord again. He has told his wife to say she is his sister, trying to take this whole situation into his hands. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5. It says here, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even, she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. Stop there. So God comes, so again, watch the picture of the story. Abraham comes in to this town. He tells Sarah, say you're my sister to King Abimelech. She does this. That night, God comes to King Abimelech in a dream and says these things to him. Says, if you don't give up this woman, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you're going to drop dead. And then Abimelech responds in the dream to God, I didn't do anything. I promise, I, I'm clean here. He's done nothing wrong. But notice in the text, it says that Sarah followed along with the sin. Abraham said, she is my sister. And Sarah agreed, he is my brother. They both went in on it. But it was Abraham who led his bride into sin. Let me say that again. It was Abraham who led his wife into sin. Brothers, let it be a word for us. Christ has placed you at the head of your home, and you have great influence over your family. Brothers, do not lead your bride into sin. I see brothers complain and convince their wives to think certain things, and then they regret it. Be very careful what you convince your family of. Be very careful what path you lead your family down. Because before you know it, it loses control. And all of a sudden, they are dabbling in things that may not have been, seemed like much at first, but all of a sudden, they're going along with it. What happens? I could see this easily happening, right? Maybe a week later or so after this had all happened, I don't know if this did happen, but I'm just using it as illustration. After Abraham told his wife to lie to the king, she goes and lies again the next week with no big deal, thinking, hey, my husband backs me on this, no big deal. And then he comes to her and says, what are you doing? Why are you lying like that? Well, we did it to the king. What does it matter? You did it. That's what I'm saying. We need to be careful. We need to set the example. We need to raise the bar. Maybe they are, people and families will become bitter at things because of the leadership of their home. Men come home and they complain about their work. They complain about the church. They complain about fill in the blank. And before you, you know it, your family adopts this idea or these things about these things that you're complaining about. And they take it and run with it. And before you know it, you have a mess on your hands. Be very careful in the direction you lead your family. Recognize that you are steering the ship. And you have the power, brothers, fathers, men tonight, husbands, the power to bless and serve and love your wife in such a way that your family will prosper. Or you have the power to step back and let the thing crash into the ground. And we see men doing this all over the place. They take their hands off the wheel, and the thing crashes into the ground. The kids don't listen. The kids jump off the deep end and start doing dumb stuff. The family stops coming to church. All kinds of things break down. The weight is on your shoulders, Ephesians 5, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church's body and is himself its savior. You are the head of... Of, of, of the family. You're like, yeah, yeah, I'm the head. I'm the head. I like that, yeah. <laughs> you got some responsibility. They like the title, but then when it comes time to step up and lead, everybody runs and tucks their tail. What's the deal? Brothers, you should be leading your family in prayer, leading your family in the Word, leading your family to church, leading your family in service. 
Leading your family. Amen. Leading your family in seeking Jesus. Leading your family in repentance. Leading your family in serving. Leaving, leading your family, not leaving, don't do that, please. <laughs> leading your family in sacrifice. Leading your family in generosity. You should be displaying the attributes of Jesus so much that it changes your family. That's your calling, 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. This does not mean that men are better than women. Both are perfectly equal in the eyes of God, made in His image. But what it means is God has called the man to lead the family. Could He have called the woman to lead the family? Sure. But for some reason, he has designed it this way. We submit to his word and his plan, and we do it. At the end of time, ladies, the men will be called forth, and they will be responsible. So do this to your husband. You take it. You take it. We're trusting you. Okay, you better lead. You better do the right thing. I'm praying for you. If the ship sinks, it's his fault. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands... Live with your wives in understanding, in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessels since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Did you hear that? He doesn't say that about the ladies. He says that only about the men. If you do not live with your wife in understanding and are not serving your family correctly, your prayers will be hindered. So serious God is about these things. Abraham made a big mistake and convinced his wife to lie instead of teaching her to trust and rely on God. What do you teach your family? When, when tragedy comes, when chaos comes, when situations break out, what do you teach them? Do you teach them to punish each other? Do you teach them to seek God? When the rent's due, do you go and say, get over here, we're going to pray and seek God. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. When issues are coming down, what do you do? Abraham's great old sin is distrust in God. He trusted in himself instead of the Lord again. Distrust can have no place in the believer's heart. Isn't that our anthem? Isn't that our cry? We trust God. God and the rest of the world doesn't. They trust in idols and other gods, but we trust in the Lord our God. But as soon as we start to distrust our God, we are leaving the place that we have been brought to. You see, it's the opposite of the world. The world tells us to believe in ourselves. The Bible tells us, believe in God. The world says, you can do it. You are great. You are good. <laughs> That's hilarious. When I look at my life, I see who I am. I try to add up all the good things and the bad things I do each week. Fail every single week. You are great. You are good. Yeah, right. The Bible says you can't do it. You are not great. God is great. You have this thing called sin. You need God to save you from it daily. It is dangerous to ever get to a place to trust in ourselves over God. Abraham is doing this. Look, God uses the nobodies of the world. Do you know that? Yep. He uses nobodies. You know why he does that? Because that person is broken and will trust in God. But the somebody, the rich and famous, they trust in themselves. Look at what I have done. Look at the kingdom that I have built. I am great, they say. And God brings them to their knees. Listen, we need to be careful. God chooses to use the weak, the small. He used little Abram out of a pagan family. He chose this guy to be the father of the faith. A pagan family who worshiped the moon god. And here he is, Father Abraham had many sons, we sing about him. Yep, he chose Moses, a dude who couldn't even speak. 
He, he got an F in oral communications class. He, he had a stuttering problem or something. He said, I can't talk. And God says, you are the one to lead three million people, the children of Israel. You are the one. Why didn't he call on Pharaoh? He chose David, the weakest and the smallest of the brothers. He said, you are going to be the king of Israel. What? Why? You want the boy playing out in the field? Yes, that's my man. What? The little guy? That's my man. Because I can use him. 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chooses the things of the world considered, considering, uh, considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chooses the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God uses nobodies in the world because they will trust God. They won't steal His glory. But God can use somebodies of the world. Watch this. But only if, only if they renounce dependence, they announce dependence on their na- uh, renounce dependence on their natural abilities and resources to God. The day that they surrender and give up on all of their abilities and their resources, that is the day that God will say, I will use that somebody that everybody looks to on the face of the earth, but not before. He will humble that first person and crush them first. Then, and only then, can he exalt that person. Abimelech's hands were out saying, look, I didn't do anything wrong. Abraham, over there trusting in himself, look at verse 6. And God said to him in a dream, the dream continues on, to Abimelech, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Wow. God basically comes to him in the dream after he said, look, I didn't do anything, I promise. God says, look, he's a prophet. I know he's done wrong. But you better let him go or you will surely die. God basically says, hand over the girl or your toast. But did you notice verse 6? That's probably one of the gnarliest verses I've seen in a little while. He says this, God says this to the king, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I, God speaking, also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God did what? He says that God withheld him and stopped him from pursuing Sarah. That God stepped in and stopped the king. Can, can God do this? He can do whatever he wants. Whenever he wants, he's God, and I'm not, and who am I to argue with what he wants to do? God says he wants to stop King Abimelech. Are you going to try to argue with him? Proverbs 21, 1 says this, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. This king, he turned his heart whichever direction he wanted to, right before us. He said, I know King Abimelech, I know. I know you didn't touch the girl. You know why you didn't touch the girl? Because I was the one in active play here. I was the one making that happen. God's plans. God had made it. Watch this. Watch the big view of this. The plan of God. God had made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son, right? So God stopped Abimelech from doing anything to Sarah that could possibly disturb the plan of God. They are to have a son, and they are to bring forth a nation, and I'm telling you, and that through that nation will come forth Messiah, and I'm telling you, nothing is getting in the way of that plan. God had planned that before the foundations of the world, and who is going to thwart it? Who's going to get in the way and say, I'm going to stop God's plan. i got uh, King Abimelech, that's my name, and I'm going to stop it. Yeah, right. God has a plan. You're not going to be able to hurt Sarah or Abram, because I have a plan to bring forth Messiah through the nation that's going to come forth through him. What an amazing, amazing point. Let me ask you this. Does God have a plan in your life? Watch this. Is anything going to thwart the plan of your life that God has for you? No. (coughs) Watch this. God is the author and finisher of our faith. Author. 
He has a plan. He knows what he's doing. And so here tonight, you wonder why this is happening to you. You wonder why this is going down. Don't worry. God has a plan in it all. He knows what he's doing just as he has a plan. I'm 100 years old and I still haven't had kids, Abraham would say. God says, I got a plan, my friend. I got to work this for my glory. Messiah is going to come through you. You're going to make a lot of mistakes and mess everything up, but it's actually going to be a part of my plan, and I'm going to work this thing out for my glory. God knows what he's doing. Can I get an amen? amen. Hey, Father knows best. You don't. Me neither. Trust our God. He knows what he's doing. Look at verse 8 to 10. So the dream ends up happening, and look at the next morning. It says, verse 8, So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much, what? Afraid. And Abimelech called Abram and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? Wow. Abimelech, the king, after the dream and after talking with God in the dream, he comes forth and he says, bring Abraham in here. And he's like, dude. He didn't say dude, but I made that up. <laughs> dude. Abe. What are you doing, man? Why did you bring this upon my household? You almost got me killed by Almighty God. You crazy? Why are you doing this? I want us to notice, watch this picture. This is, this is scary. But I almost feel this is a picture of the church sometimes. Notice the believer, no, here you go, the believer, Abraham, standing in front of the non-believer, supposed to be the example and the witness that is being displayed of God. Abraham lies to Abimelech. Abimelech has done nothing wrong. And here is the witness. Abraham has completely blown his witness to this king. This non-believing pagan king. And the sad thing is, this is a picture of the church a lot. How can the redeemed people of God who have tasted of His grace and love do worse things than non-believers at times. You know what I'm talking about? I don't like hearing things like, I don't, I even hear this from Christian businessmen. They will say, I don't like doing business with Christians. What? Because Christians many times aren't honest. Because they don't uphold their side of the deal. They flake out. They do all kinds of stuff. And this is the worst thing that can happen. A non-believer looking greater than the Christian in this moment. Wow. Why are the heathens doing greater things for the city than the church? How can we be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, set apart for His glory, called out of darkness and into His marvelous light, yet we do not live like it. Christian, in your workplace, you should be the hardest working person. You should be the most kind, generous, servant person in the place, in the building, in your workplace. Everybody should recognize that you shouldn't have to convince anyone. Why? Because the Bible says so? No. Because you have tasted and experienced the one who serves you and has ministered to you and loved you and forgived you and been gracious to you and poured out all kinds of things upon you and it should move you so much that you would want to display this type of lifestyle to the city and the place that you work in that it would, again, it would bring God glory through your lifestyle. Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men they would see your good works and give glory to to your Father who is in heaven. Let me ask you this. Has anyone ever given glory to God for the way that you work? Given glory to God for the way that you live? Or are you the one lying behind the scenes? Are you the one stealing from your boss 
and the other employees know it. Anyone who shows up late all the time and doesn't work hard, and you make excuses and you complain. Really? And you've tasted of God's grace? We've got to be a different people. What a shame that this is the way, the saddest thing about this story, the saddest thing about this story, if you didn't hear it, hear it again. The saddest thing about this story is that God is not displayed through Abraham's life as he stands before the king. God has to come through a dream and reveal himself because Abraham is not godly enough to display it there in that moment. And one of the saddest things that has happened in the church today is that God has to go around the backside to save people because the church is not living for the gospel and for his glory. There's something wrong, church. Have you tasted of God? I pray that it would move you so much. You say, how can I not display his attributes in my life? How can I not live this way? One of the greatest stumbling blocks for people in the world One of the greatest stumbling blocks for people not believing the gospel is hypocritical Christians. Yep. So maybe mom and dad didn't display it in their life and they're so bitter at it now. And they say it's an intellectual problem. They say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe there's a God. Yet they're so bitter at dad or mom or family member because they were a pastor or they were a Christian and they displayed the gospel so terribly. Their life was not known as a life of grace. I hope nothing but God's grace moves you tonight to want to live more for His glory. That you would say, Lord, please, I pray, I don't want that to be me. I want to live for your glory. Look at verse 11. To verse 13, and Abraham said, because I thought, here's his reason. He says, why have you done this? Abimelech says, why have you done this to me, Abraham? Here's the lamest excuse in the book. Right now, we should read in the text, God came down, his hand came down from heaven and slapped Abraham in the face. It's not there though, it should be. Look at this, verse 11, lame excuses. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. Really? The fear of God is in this place. He was scared to death in the dream, so much so he calls all his servants in and he's about to do something radical. And it says this, and they will kill me on account of my wife, but indeed she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it, he t- Look at the excuses. Look at the play on words here. And it came to pass, verse 13, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever I go. Say of me, he is my brother. Lame. Say lame. Lame. Say lame. You know what he should have said? I have sinned before Almighty God. That's what has happened here. I did wrong, and I'm sorry, King Abimelech. I have been a terrible witness as a Christian. And there are some of you here tonight, maybe you me to make that statement to your family or to your friends or in your workplace, and then you need to start living for God's glory. Think about the depths of Abraham's distrust. God promised him a son. This is how far the, the distrust is. God promised him a son and a covenant. Remember all the big covenant thing that he did? He cut the animals in half, and God himself walked in between the animals, signing the contract by himself before Abram. This huge miracle went down right in front of his face. I promise you a son. You will not die. You will be alive. You will have a son, and through him will come forth descendants as many as the stars in the sky. That promise has been made. Look at the excuse. I thought I was going to be killed. I thought, that, I thought that the king was going to take my life. Really? Don't you remember God's promise? He said that you were going to have a son, and, and he has this huge plan of, of Messiah coming through it. And Don't you remember all that? Oh, yeah, I, oh, I kind of forgot, you know. You forget that big thing, that big promise, that one thing. You're going to be Father Abraham and many sons. This is how big, how deep the distrust is. It's spitting in the face of of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Again, I think God should not slap him once. God should take off the glove. And two slaps to the face right in front of King Abimelech. And the, I would love it if it said, and the angel of the Lord came down with a glove. <laughs> and he slapped Abraham in the face three times and then went back to heaven. <laughs> Even though Abraham did all these things before Abimelech, putting him in great danger, 
almost got him killed. You want to know what happens? Get ready. Watch the hero. Watch the king. Watch God be put on display now. His grace is about to be displayed. He should have been slapped in the face, but take a look at verse 14. Are you ready? Strap on your seatbelts. My favorite part. Then King Abimelech took out his sword and killed him. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Take a look. What does it say? Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. My land is your land. Mikasa is sukasa. Dwell where it pleases you. Then Sarah, he said this to Sarah. Look at this. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother. He calls him brother. A thousand pieces of silver. You know what the payment should have been according to the law? 50 pieces. 50 pieces. He gave him 20 times the amount of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, and they bore children. For the Lord had cho- has closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah and Abram's, uh, Sarah, Abram's wife. Wow. Isn't that amazing? God moves Abimelech to now bless Abram, I can't even imagine what's happening. He's sitting there looking like an idiot. And he's like, here, here, here's some oxen. Here's a bunch of animals. Here's a bunch of servants. And here is 10 million bucks. Here you go. And Abraham is saying like, what? Man is not the hero, my friend. We mess everything up. If it was according to the world, this story... The king should have killed Abraham. But instead, God stepped in as the hero and saved Abraham, though he didn't deserve it. And is that not the story of our lives? I'm telling you tonight, you have come here, and I know already, because I know people, you have sinned before God. You have messed up everything. And God should put us all to death for the sins that we have done. We should be sentenced to hell. We have sinned greatly before Him because He is a righteous and perfect judge. We deserve it. But you know what He's done instead? He said, no, I'm not going to put you to death. I'm not going to punish you. You know what I'm going to do? Here, let's bring my son over here, Jesus. I'm going to punish him. And I'm going to put him to death. And I'm going to throw him to hell so that you can go free. So that your sin can be forgiven. So that you can receive heaven. And so you can have all the blessings and promises and go free. What? Yeah. You did all the wrong. You deserve punishment. And God says, I'm going to punish Jesus. I'm going to punish my son for your sins. That's grace, my friend. That's what God has done here tonight for many. I would hope you would be like Abraham ultimately. As he is a man of faith. He's not the best guy. He's just the guy who calls upon God to be saved. And I pray that you would do that now. That you put away your old sins, the things that haunt you day and night, and that you would turn to the Lord Jesus with all of your heart now. God wants to bless you. God wants to give you grace. Let's pray. Let's go before Him. Lord, Your grace rebukes us. Your mercy blows us away. Lord, we recognize we deserve punishment. We see our sin before us now. We see ourselves falling back into old sins. We see ourselves messing up and dropping the ball. We see there are some here tonight, Lord, that you are calling upon that are living in sin right now. And you are calling them to repentance. You are telling them, I want to forgive your sin. I have punished my son Jesus so you don't have to be punished. I've taken care of it. I want to save you. I want to give you the gift of heaven. And I want to pour out blessings on you and promises on you. I want to be committed to you forever and ever. God is declaring tonight through his word, through the gospel.